Um, we have quite a lineup, as you see. So what I'd like to do is just, if each one of you would introduce yourself, tell your film, introduce who you are and what role you played, and we'll just get an introduction out. And then I'd like you to be thinking of the questions you'd like to ask our guests. So I'm um, uh, Brett Garamella, co-director of The Champion. I'm Patrick McGowan. I'm also co-director of The Champion. I'm uh, Zach Carver, the writer-director of Sin Matador. Uh, Anne Husani, co-director of Sander Kraut. Emily Lobson, co-director of Sander Kraut. Esher uh, actor, producer, and subject. I'm Shuck. I'm uh, Jamie Donaghy, writer-director of Shock. I would love to ask you in the audience who has a question for either to address to all of our guests or direct to a certain. Yes, please. Wonderful question. Um, the question is, she'd like to know if you could, each, someone from each film, talk about where you found your story. All right, so um, in 2009, I was living in Chicago and I randomly um, ran into Estefan Shalita. So he was just driving down the street and then he stopped his car. He was waiting for a ride and we just uh, began talking and it just struck me like instantly how um, just his charm, the authenticity of who he was. I thought he was so gregarious and so compelling um, that I thought, whoa, there's a story here. And then, he talked more and more, and as I found out, he was from Iraq, and I thought that was really pertinent since the U.S. was in, Iro in war with Iraq at the time. And then he also told me that he was a boxing champion in, our, in Iraq. And I was like, whoa, because I've always been a huge boxing fan. So um, we just got talking, and, and um, then we started working on the film. But you know, um, those were some of the things that I first noticed about him but it was uh, so much more than that. Thank you. Do you, do you want to add something? Or? Well, you know, when I first met Brett in, around that same time, and he pitched the story, and he mentioned, like, the boxing and coming from Iraq. And we didn't, we didn't totally know where we were going to go with the story, but when we met the family, you know, they had this marriage for, like, 37 years, and they're still happily married. They're, they still love each other so much. We're like, That's, that seems so rare now. It seems so cool. They're, like, they're, they're such a cool family. They, they're, I mean, that was, we, we knew we had to, Tell the story. Um, so Sin Matador came from, I'm not totally sure where it came from, but it came from, <laughs> I just had this image of a dude coming home from a really long day and having these two dudes in a bowl in his elevator and getting wrapped up in that world. So it started with two dudes in a bowl in an elevator? Yes. And that was where it started. That's the generative okay. image. And then That's... I had a writing deadline at Columbia University and turned it into a short. So. Anne and Emily, Sandra Kraut? Um, I think we both um, separately knew, we, we actually didn't meet that long before we started making the film. Um, and we were both just huge fans of his work. Um, not like, I, I think, and I think both for the same reason that he writes these books that are not cookbooks, even though they're about fermentation and how to create, like how to make fermented products. They're more like these, I mean, explorations of like humanity and culture and personal experience. Um, and I think we both were just so attracted to that. And I happened to have a friend who knew him um, and I'd always planned to do something with him one day. And then she and I met at a party and uh, started, got on a subject of it. And uh, we're like, we should make this movie. So I don't yeah. know if you wanna add anything. Yeah, I mean, just to, I mean, to follow up on what you said, I mean, it was, um, she had been interested in him for about three years and I was at a point where I was starting to get into just health and sauerkraut making. <laughs> and, uh, and it was a situation where um, I picked up his book and um, one of the things that blew me away was that uh, towards the end of a chapter about, I don't know, Italy or something, I was looking for a recipe. It was like he was describing um, how a friend of his had passed away from HIV um, at his community and, um, and just uh, his own perception of like uh, death and how it related to relationship to microorganisms and uh, the process of fermentation. I was like, 
Oh, wow, I was just looking for a sauerkraut recipe, which has happened. <laughs> <laughs> so we were both, I, but we just really synced on that, so, yeah. Okay, so I knew nothing about Kosovo four years ago, and I, I got a job uh, for two days shooting a commercial out there, and I went out there, and the Icelandic volcano erupted, and I couldn't get a flight home for five weeks. And I was stuck in a country, I didn't know anybody, didn't, couldn't speak the language or anything at all. Um, and I thought, right, well, I can sit in my room or I can get out there and start meeting people. And I got out and found what amazing country it was and it like instantly made some really, really good friends. Um, and I knew there'd been a war that had gone on, but I had no idea what had happened um, to the country. And it was such a positive country um, just coming out of, of the end of war. And it reminded me what it must have been like for my grandparents after World War II and... Um, that that real hope that was in the country and appreciation of freedom as well and I um, and my which were now my friends were telling me these absolutely horrendous stories that and I was embarrassed I knew nothing about them and um, thought that I really needed to get the word out and uh, I wanted to make a film and then Eshraf and I met and I heard all about his stories and he toured me all around Kosovo and um, yeah uh, about, we started working on it about a year and a half ago and uh, yeah, here we are, we've made it now. Mm. <laughs> Eshref, do you want to add anything? Um, no, just after um, we met with Jamie and um, yeah, I'm, I was just like having drinks, having fun in Pristina, so we have a really, really good life night in Pristina. <laughs> so, and um, I just, I'm a person that I like to share my stories with people, so my experience. And yeah, then Jamie, after a few, weeks or something, he says, um, I think I'm writing a script about your story, and what, so what do you think? So, you know, that's great, so, and here we are. Mm -hmm. And I think actually we have a couple world premieres here this evening, yes? But you have to remind me, because I know this is the first time you've screened with an audience, is that correct? And first time you've screened with an audience, so, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm really happy to be in Aspen, uh, and this, this is my first time in, in the States, and yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, but yeah, it's, it's for our applause, because it's not so easy for our from Kosovo to, to, to move so free, because we need a certain visa and a lot of things, and I'm really happy that we have tonight the world premiere and such a nice audience and such a nice uh, festival. Thank you very much. Question in the balcony? Yeah, what does the title shock mean? Do you want to answer it? Yeah. Shock in Albanian means friend. So this is that friendship between these two boys and shock means uh, friend. So but we wanted to play that card with two meanings. Um, more questions, please. Somebody? In the orchestra level? Yes, please. Yes, actually, uh, the movie is based in th three stories, three uh, real stories. It, one of them, it was my story. The, uh, my story was that one in the bus when the kid got hit from um, police, which was played by me. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I, when I was 14, I got hit from the police. So. And Jamie offered me this role to play the opposite, so it was very challenging for me to play the opposite what happens to me. So I can just tell, uh, add a little bit about the story, what, how it was happened to me. I was, because in Kosovo at the time, the Serbs were closed, all the schools. Otherwise, um, you, you couldn't go to the school or you go to the Serbian school, so learn and speak Serbian. I was traveling with bus going to school and um, there were, often so checkpoints where the police came in, arrest people, force them to go to the army, and a police officer come and asked me for the ID card in Serbian languages, but I didn't speak at that time Serbian language, and I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand you, and he turned to me in fluent Albanian, he says, your ID card, I say, I don't have one, and he asked me where I'm going, I said, I'm going to school, and he's slapped me twice and says, next time when I see you, you should speak Serbian, because it's, you are not allowed to go to Albania school. 14. 
I'd like to actually ask the next question for all of you. I, I think that um, for the well, for your document, for the two documentaries, it, uh, the authenticity is that's part of what you're doing. So I'd like to, uh, for you, I'd like to ask, um, with the recreations of the boxing, where was the decision to add that element as opposed to just telling a straightforward story about this amazing cabbie and his really challenging life and his great spirit? Talk about the decision to use the boxing reenactments, which I think are very effective. Um, I mean, we were, I think we wanted to add something visual to it. We, we, wanted, we wanted like a sense of dynamics. We wanted, you know, we wanted you to go on his journey with him, I guess. And we wanted to like, have you feel like you're rooting for him in that fight and that you want him to win, you want him to pull through. Um, you know, we were looking at the photos and the photos were cool, but we wanted something a little more. We wanted you to really feel that excitement that he was going through. Um, and I guess it's also just a, maybe a creative challenge. Like we, we had all this interview footage we wanted to use. We had some photos, but we didn't want it to just be the photos in his, in his interview. So I think it was sort of a creative challenge that we wanted to solve that way. Well, it adds a tone and it, as you say, it, it adds a, a dynamism to the film and a kind of poetry to the film that um, gives it an emotional depth. At least that was my experience of watching it. Um, Zach, for you, um, you're creating this crazy experience in the basement of a Manhattan apartment building. So talk about the challenges that you had of where you like, how you made the visual choices that you did to kind of keep it straight, but then make it surreal. Um, well, the, I mean, it's shot in multiple locations. And so, you know, you've got the, their lobby is a different building than the bull ring, which is different than the place he's held captive. And then like where she's walking back and forth before she looks in the window is a different place from the window. So just connecting all those was really hard visually. Um, but we tried to keep uh, restrict through point of view, um, keep it through Darren's point of view and, and, uh, and just try to do as much as we could to show how this is a plausible, though not very probable experience. <laughs> And did you storyboard it? Oh yeah, we, we did storyboard. Um, and uh, yeah, I had a great, actually Colorado guy um, who lives in Colorado Springs did some great storyboards and sketches for us. And uh, uh, Coltrane Bennett. And did you change much from the script to the, to the final edit? What? We actually didn't, it's a 20 page script that ended up at 13 minutes and we only cut a couple of lines. It was really just sped up, just very, very sped up. And um, I shall say on further, it's about what it's about, on further excavation of my subconscious, we found out it was more about like uh, my experience moving to New York and just this crazy city and what it does to you, so. <laughs> okay. Um, for Ann and Emily, had you made films, you said that you, you met at a party, so you decided to make this film together. Um, and you had made, you, you both are filmmakers, it wasn't like this was your your first time out. Um, one of the things that I love about the film is how much texture you give it. I mean, his, his kitchen, his cabinets, like all the labels and everything. And I'm just, can you talk about the choices that you made in terms of w how you wanted, we don't, we only see his compost pile. We don't really see anything terribly decomposing. But um, how did you make the choices that, like, did you always have that look in, in your head, or was it working with him and shooting that you started to go closer in? Well, I think that a lot of the textures and the visuals are just naturally there in his environment, and it's just very easy to be drawn to them as something to pick out. But um, I would really like to give some of this to Emily because she had a really strong vision for um, a lot of the food preparation segments. So I think you should talk about that. Um, I guess, I mean, I, we both did this. Like before, we, we knew that we were doing this on, we didn't decide to raise money for it or anything. We were just like, let's fly to Tennessee for a weekend and just do this because we both are filmmakers. We knew that like we didn't, we had all the resources within like what we could do. Um, we had friends that we could call on to, you know, do like we ended up having a friend shoot it. I was debating shooting it. Um, uh, but we both, you know, Anne's an incredible editor. Um, we cut it together. Um, but, um, 
but uh, planning out the shooting definitely was, you know, we composed a lot of the, it was almost like shooting, uh, I, I work in both narrative and documentary, or fiction and documentary, and, um, you know, plotting out this film was very much like a process, which we did together, um, plotting out the, the, the scenes almost that we would have, and we didn't know how they would come together. We kind of were aware of what he might talk about, um, my favorite scene, I mean, I don't know if I should even say this, but like, is the cabbage like scene with the Bach. And that, I think the reason I love that the most is that, yeah, I had a very strong vision for like when he makes the sauerkraut and I had ideas about the music and everything. And, um, but Anne actually cut that scene together without me seeing it. Uh, we both, I mean, we both edited the film, but Anne really was like the editor on that scene. And when I saw it, I was like, oh my God, that's exact. <laughs> and like, so I just love that scene because I feel like, um, like the texture in it is so important, both visual and um, oral texture. Um, and the sound was also really important to us just because we wanted you to be really in his world and it to be a very physical, I think both of us like really enjoy really like sort of physical films. I think everyone on this stage has a film that I'm just like, oh, that's so good. Um, partially because of those characteristics that like there's all these layers of texture in every single realm that film is a medium. Um, Jamie um, and Eshraf, if you could talk about, um, you shot this in Kosovo, and I, and it, like yesterday when we saw Chicken, it almost all takes place in an apartment, but you are shooting in public spaces for some of this, and, and you're using Kosovo and actors, I'm assuming, that, and, and in, in the, the native language. Can you talk about, to create that authenticity, how you dealt with maybe some of the sensitivities um, because the conflict is not very old, really? That was one of the biggest challenges in the film for me personally, and I think that one thing I was always conscious of was I was an international going to somebody else's country telling essentially their stories as well. Um, the way I took that on was really doing my research and um, not making this film just for an international audience but also for the people of Kosovo as well um, so I was as true as I could be to the war and what happened and um, as I was saying to you yesterday as well there's, there's a lot of little things in the film that we wouldn't normally pick up but mean a lot to the Kosovan people. For, for instance, there's a shot of a horse drawn on a wall um, and without going into too much detail, that was one of the techniques that the Serbs used where they would uh, make the Kosovans draw horses on the walls and then say to them, get on and ride the horse or we'll kill you. Um, and so obviously that means quite a lot to, um, to the people there. And finally, this, the soundtrack that we used as well um, is actually it's an old it's an old lullaby, isn't it? That was um, sung by mothers during the war, um, and it's about it's about growing up, a boy growing up to become a man. And we actually travelled up into the villages of Kosovo and found one of the old famous uh, women singers who hadn't sung since the war. And we asked her one more time to sing the song, and that's actually recorded on an iPhone in the village in her house. Um, so that song evokes quite a lot more. Um, to a cost of an audience as well, and uh, hopefully I've made it for both audiences. So, um, like I said before, I like to share stories, and, um, and now I think after the war, there are many years gone, and people that I, I, I see to the people of Kosovo that they, they have this feeling that they should tell the stories to the other people, so that it was very helpful. Um, the people in where we shoot in the villages, I, I must mention that because in Kosovo, the only city which has still problems is Mitrovica, where I came from. So the, the city is divided in, in the two parts, in south and north. In the north are the Serbs still, and the south, the, they are Albanian. So we shoot it very close to the north <laughs> part. So we were really, very really close there. But the people, they were, um, we were really lucky because the people helped us a lot um, because they knew that we are telling something good. We are telling something that what happened there. So even um, random people, um, they, they have been always, uh, sometimes I, I really was angry with them because we were shooting and we were, we had and hundreds of people watching us and helping us and sometimes that, <laughs> that was not so good for us, but um, almost. <laughs> 
Um, I wanted to ask you one other question, and if you don't want to answer it, it's fine. Um, when you had to play the role of the aggressor, that must have been very difficult. But maybe it wasn't. I, uh, yeah. How was it for you? Um, so we, we were talk, uh, we, Jamie taught, uh, told me that he wrote the script and he sent me to read it and, and you know, and after a while he said, um, I have a role for you in the, in the script. And I said, how come? I would just like, I see the two boys are the main characters. The family is grandma, and grandpa, mother and sister. So I didn't, I didn't saw any role for me. And he said, uh, how about to play dragon? I said, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and that's challenged me a lot because, um, and I said directly, yes, I will play it. Because I'm, I knew it, I, I knew it very well how to be so mean. Because when I was 14, I was looking at that police officer in the eyes when he was hitting me. So I think I knew it very well to play that role. It wasn't, a, I was, you know, just a little bit saying, um, what should I do? But at the end I said, yeah. And at, at the end I'm in the act, I, I'm in the actor, so <laughs> I need to play any role that the director gives me. But that was very particular and uh, very challenging for me. More questions, please. Yes. Uh, Pat the Ox was incredibly good to work with. Um, he came with four or five handlers from a place called Dawn Animal Agency that's this rescue agency. It's like three generations of women that work with animals and they were amazing. They were able to get the head swings and he was a bit old so getting him to move quickly was a bit tough but um, and he can only go forward. I learned this. Uh, so the elevator set, we had to make the back come off so you can walk him in, and then he has to go out through the doors, <laughs> go around. Uh, <laughs> so there were challenges, but, but actually, he was pretty good. How'd you get him to eat the asparagus? Um, he likes the grain that we mixed in with the asparagus, so couldn't quite. They, they, they were like, we're trying to feed it to him. We put butter, we put salt, we did, you know. So anyway. <laughs> Somebody else with a question? Yes, please. The question is, you met your subject when there was the, the U.S.-Iraq war. Did you have any opinion? Is the question if you had opinions about the war at that time? Well, I think everyone has an opinion about war. Anytime there's war anywhere, someone is always going to have um, really strong opinions because it's such a, you know, such a tough time. And... Um, for us, I think we wanted to focus on the human side. So for a Stefan, we thought, you know, you turn on the television all the time, all you see is bad things happening in Iraq, right? But what about all the ordinary people who are living in Iraq, just like you and I are living in the United States? So we thought this film was really important because we wanted to show a different side of Iraq and just the, the human side of, of a country that often does not get to be seen. Yeah. yeah. One more question. Uh, oh, oh so I'm sorry. Oh, the, well, the only thing I wanted to add was, Lena, towards the end you see like the, the bombing of that church and you see like the, the, the current situation now. So I think there's like a lasting feeling that they'll never have their country back. You know, the problems are too big, it seems. It feels like they can just never have that connection again. So I think that was the, I think that's the biggest connection to the war, is feeling like they just can never connect back with their family again. One more question. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. That was your, you, that was your question. You have a question? Have, okay, well, we're going to go with one more. Did you, John, did you have a follow-up to that? You just... It's very, yeah, it's very unusual. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, I don't know, I think we wanted to balance that. We didn't want it to be totally about 
uh, Christianity versus any other religions, but it is something that, you know, it's something that's part of American culture of Christianity. And we sort of started a war where now we're seeing the toll, we're seeing like our culture, he talks about like we're the first Christians, you know, that's a big part, of that's Assyrian Babylonian culture that's in Iraq that's being really destroyed right now. So I think that was kind of part of it, seeing that culture mm. go away in Iraq. And I just got a signal that it's time for us to wrap up. So I want to thank you all very much for thank being you. here with your films. Thank you.